All right, boys, new unit, new suit. Anyway, some logistical stuff before we get started. Uh, AP Chemistry features a reference table, three pages. You're gonna need to go print that out before we get started. Have one on hand. In fact, have one with you every time you watch one of these videos. It's pretty essential to understand what's going on. It's three pages. I'm, I think I'm gonna link it down below. It's just periodic table and then two pages of equations, okay? And the, this is absolutely essential. Like you can't learn the material or take the exam without this. So past that, uh, with reference to your periodic table, you're gonna need to do a great deal of memorization with this. First of all, uh, you're going to need to memorize uh, the names of all of the compounds in the first three rows, like the first row starting with hydrogen, the second row starting with lithium, third row starting with uh, sodium, and excuse me, you're also going to need the fourth row starting with potassium. Okay. So memorize the first four rows of the periodic table, the names of the compounds, like identify what symbol corresponds to what name. And beyond that, you're going to need to memorize the names of all the ions. Like, for example, uh, you're going to need to memorize the name of hydroxide, uh, permanganate, uh, NO3, which is uh, paired with an H plus to make nitric acid, HNO3, whatever. Memorize the names of all the common ions, all of the polyatomic ions. You just need to search up a list on Google of all of the uh, common polyatomic ions, or all the AP chemistry polyatomic ions, and you're going to need to memorize that list going forward. Because on the exam, they're going to name a polyatomic ion, like in an FRQ, they're going to name, like, potassium permanganate, and you're going to need to read the words potassium permanganate and instantly know that that's KMNO4. Okay? So... That's just a bit of logistics before we get started. I suggest you do all of that, like, right now. Pause the video right now and don't come back until you've you've done all that memorization and printing out your reference table, etc. So we're going to start uh, right away here with uh, topic 1.1 in AP Chemistry, which is mass and molar mass, okay? Molar mass is a new word. But I hope mass is something you guys are already accustomed with, you know? We are, we're used to measuring mass in grams and kilograms, okay? So, you know, when you put something on the scale, it usually reads out in kilograms with, with chemistry scales. If you step on your scale at home, it's probably going to measure in pounds. But anyway, every scale in a chemistry lab measures in grams not in ounces or pounds or all of this American stupidity. I'm an American, okay? It's okay. <laughs> but let me introduce a new unit to you, the unit of moles. The mass of a species, from now on I'm going to use the word species. Species just means any chemical entity, any atom, any element, any molecule, any mixture, anything that contains particles. Um, it can be referred to as a species, okay? So any chemical species has a mass, right? But the mass doesn't tell me anything about specifically how many particles I'm dealing with. And in chemistry, you will see that's important. We need to know how many particles we're dealing with because we need to know how many particles can react. So moles is precisely that unit. Moles tells us how many particles we're dealing with, okay? Now, obviously, if moles was a direct representation of particles, it would be an enormously large number, okay? So to simplify that, we have uh, Avogadro's number. I'm just going to abbreviate that as AVG, Avogadro's number. Avogadro's number is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, I believe. Wait, it tells us on the AP Chemistry reference table what Avogadro's number is. Uh, it says here, Avogadro's number, yes. That's Avogadro's number. 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Okay? 
if you take your moles, how many moles you have, and you multiply that by Avogadro's number, then you get the amount of particles. Okay? So, our moles is generally a much smaller number, okay? Something in the domain of 0 0.01 to 10, okay? It's a usable number that we can uh, fit into our brains. It's effectively the number of particles divided by this enormous Avogadro's number. Okay, so how do we find moles? The relationship between the mass of a species and the amount of particles you have is a constant relationship, okay? If you add more mass, you have more moles, okay? Now, what I want you to look at in your reference table right now is under each of the species listed in your reference table, under each of the elements listed in your reference table, there is a number, okay? Let's take the one for oxygen, for example. The uh, number beneath oxygen is 16.00. That number represents something called the molar mass. Okay? So we just combined these two words, moles and mass, and we got molar mass. Okay, so what, what the heck is a molar mass? A molar mass has these units. His molar mass is in units of grams per mole. Okay, so you would say the molar mass of oxygen is 16 grams per mole. So it's a ratio. It's a relationship. Meaning, if I have one gram of single oxygen atoms, you'd never see this in real life, but let's pretend that we have one gram of single oxygen atoms. All right, so let me introduce you to this thing called dimensional analysis, okay? We're gonna to need to use a bit of dimensional analysis to convert our one gram of single oxygen atoms into moles of oxygen atoms, okay? So we start with our one gram here, one gram O, okay? And we want to have units of moles, okay? So we're going to need to cancel out grams. So we're going to need to multiply that by a ratio that has grams in the denominator. Okay? If we multiply it by a ratio that has grams in the denominator, then the grams cancel out. Okay? And since we want units of moles, we need to have moles in the numerator. So that moles persists through the uh, equation to give us a unit, give us an answer, a final answer in units of moles. So the molar mass of oxygen is 16 grams per mole. We can't multiply this by 16 because in this configuration, grams is on top and moles is on the bottom. We don't want that. We want it the other way around. So we put 16 grams on the bottom and one mole on top. That way, our units cancel out and our dimensional analysis, that's what this process is called, our dimensional analysis yields an answer in units of moles. Okay? So, we multiply the tops by each other. We get one in the numerator of our answer. Divided by 16, our grams cancel out and we're looking at one sixteenth of a mole. One gram of oxygen becomes one sixteenth of a mole of oxygen. Okay, that's effectively how you calculate how many moles you have. So, and if we multiply that by Avogadro's number, we have this number divided by 16 particles of oxygen. That number divided by 16 atoms of oxygen. Let's take it a step further now. If I gave you one gram of H2O, and I asked you to find how many moles of H2O you have, what would we do there? We need to add up 
Well, what we first need to do is we need to find the total molar mass of this, of this whole species. We need to find the total molar mass. In the previous example, the total molar mass of oxygen was just the molar mass of oxygen. Here, we're going to need to find the total molar mass of water. So what we do is we find, okay, we have one oxygen and two hydrogen atoms. So we take the molar mass of oxygen, 16.00 grams per mole, plus the molar mass of a hydrogen atom, 1.008 grams per mole, plus the molar mass of another hydrogen atom, 1.008 grams per mole, and we add those all together to get the molar mass of this species, water. That's going to become 18.016 grams per mole. Okay, so now we have our ratio. Now we can do the calculation. Now we can do the dimensional analysis. Okay, you know, let me make this a bit more fun. How about I gave you 2 grams of H2O? We would start with our 2 grams H2O. Remember, we're trying to find moles. So we need to cancel out the grams with gra units of grams on the denominator. And we're looking for moles, so we need units of moles in the numerator. We've got 18.016 grams per mole. We've got the grams on the bottom, so the 18.016 goes on the bottom with it per one mole. Okay, grams cancel out and we multiply across. We get two moles over 18.016 and let's divide that by 2 to simplify this. 1 mole over 9.008 or 1 over 9.008 moles. 2 grams of water is one of one, pretty much 1 ninth of a mole of water. That's pretty much moles and molar mass. Okay, let's move on next to mass spectroscopy. So if you look at your reference table right now, you'll realize that the molar mass numbers beneath each of your elements, it's almost never a really round whole number. Why is that? Because um, the way molar mass is calculated is you look at the atom, and protons are assigned a value of one atomic mass unit, neutrons are assigned a value of one atomic mass unit, and electrons are nearly massless, so they're, neg they're negated, they're not considered in the mass calculation. And what scientists do when they calculate molar mass, when they calculate that number beneath your element, is they just count up all the protons, and they count up all the neutrons, and they add those two numbers together. So, for example, in hydrogen, there is one proton and no neutrons, so you would expect there to be uh, one molar mass of hydrogen. Hydrogen to have a molar mass of one, but it doesn't. It has a molar mass of 1.008. That's because not all hydrogen atoms have one proton and no neutrons. You can have deuterium, which is one proton and one neutron. You can have tritium, which is one proton and two neutrons. Okay, so that's what we call an isotope. An isotope is a chemical species, it's an atom, that has more or less neutrons than it's supposed to. And by supposed to, we're using that supposed to characterization for the most common form of the atom. So because the form of hydrogen that has one proton and no neutrons is the most common form, we assume that hydrogen is supposed to have one proton and no neutrons. Okay? So the way that factors into a uh, molar mass of 1.008 is uh, we are given a mass spectroscopy of isotopes, such that it's a graph where on the y-axis it's percent abundance, 
and on the x-axis you have the different isotopes. Right? So for example, you can have uh, no neutrons, one neutron, or two neutrons. Okay, and the relative abundance of hydrogen with zero neutrons is like 98%. And one neutron is like 1%, and two neutrons is like 1%. So this, this is the type of graph you would see on the AP Chemistry exam. Okay, they would give you a graph like this, where you would have the relative abundance, and here you'd say about 98% of all of the hydrogen atoms in existence have no neutrons. This is not correct information, by the way. This is just for the sake of example, just so you guys know. About 1% of all the hydrogen atoms in existence have about one neutron, and 1% have two neutrons. Okay? So we take a weighted average we take a weighted average of all of these, okay? So the molar mass of this guy would be one, the molar mass of this guy would be two, the molar mass of this guy would be three, because in each of these cases, we've got the neutrons plus the protons. So this has one proton, one proton plus one neutron, one proton plus two neutrons. And that is our weighted average. Once you calculate all of that up, so you do the, uh, mass of the species multiplied by its relative abundance as a decimal, and you get uh, 0 0.98 plus 0 0.02 plus 0 0.03, and you, can, you get a value around 1.03. Okay, so you'll see that that's not the same as that. They do that on purpose, okay? If you got a question like this on the AP exam, that they are very rarely the exact value as the atomic mass value you're given on your reference table. Okay, so that they can then ask you the question of, given that you did not know what element this was, now that you've calculated its atomic mass, why don't you tell us what element it was? So you'd be given a graph like this, and you'd be asked, find out which element this is. And you'd calculate this value. You'd say, oh, 1.03. That's closest to 1.008. So this is a graph of the mass spectroscopy of hydrogen. Okay, next topic. Molecular and empirical formulas, okay? So let me give you an example. How about ethane? You don't need to memorize that it's called ethane. C2H6, okay? That is the molecular formula of ethane, okay? Because ethane has two carbons and six hydrogens, all right? You don't need to memorize what ethane is. I'm just using it as an example. But the empirical formula of ethane, the empirical formula is just the most basic ratio between the constituent atoms of ethane. So the empirical formula for ethane would be CH3, okay? Because all of the atoms, all of the carbon and hydrogen atoms in ethane are uh, constructed in this ratio. For every one carbon atom, there is three hydrogen atoms. You can think of the empirical formula as how can I simplify this into its most common ratio, okay? So this is molecular, this is empirical. Now if I gave you uh, C2H5OH, that's ethanol. You don't need to memorize it's ethanol. However, this would be the molecular formula and the empirical formula because you cannot simplify that down to a whole number ratio, okay? If I tried to divide by two, like I did up here, I would get C, well, this H can be, can come over here to be H6. I would get C, H3, O, one half. Okay, and we're not gonna, that's not the empirical formula. 
we don't want fractions in our uh, atom subscripts. So this is the most simplified ratio of all of the atom constituents. Okay. So with empirical formula, you will see one of the most common AP chemistry FRQs that appears on the exam. With empirical formula is brings about the FRQ of combustion analysis. Okay, now what the heck is that? Let me show you. So in the combustion analysis FRQ, they're always going to give you some hydrocarbon. As the name might entail, it's an atom that contains hydrogens and carbons. So let's say, for example, they gave you butane. C4H10, I think. Right? Yeah, C4H10. All hydrocarbons react with oxygen. React with some amount of oxygen to produce some amount of CO2 and some amount of H2O. Okay? So if we take a look at this reaction and we try to balance it, all right, by balancing it means that we add coefficients to uh, each species in the reaction so that everything equals out. You see I have four carbons on this side and only one carbon on that side. So I need to balance it out. I need to add a four coefficient here to signify that these four carbons become the carbon in four CO2s so that I have the same amount of particles, same amount of uh, elements on each side. So we can write a little chart. We've got carbon present, we've got hydrogen present, and we've got oxygen present. We've got four carbons on this side, and I just balanced it to give us four carbons on that side. Next, let's look at the hydrogens. I've got ten hydrogens on this side, and I've got two hydrogens on this side. So I'm going to need to balance that by adding a coefficient of five. Excuse me. There you go. So, now oxygen was our remainder. In order to uh, balance the amount of carbons and hydrogens, we had to do something to these oxygens. Okay, so in this species, we uh, got eight oxygens. So that's eight oxygens here plus five oxygens here. So that gave us a total of 13 oxygens on this side of the equation. And now we need to get 13 oxygens on this side of the equation. So to get 13 here, this is O2, okay? So what I need to do here is I need to add a coefficient of 6.5 to the O2. 6.5 times the two oxygens gives me 13. You can use fractions when you balance equations. You cannot use fractions in empirical formulas. Just so you go there. Also, the fractions that you use in uh, balancing equations, they need to make sense. So what do I mean by that? A fraction makes sense if I can actually divide the molecule how the fraction tells me to. So in this case right here, I've got 6 and 1 half O2, okay? So that's 6 O2 plus a half of an O2, all right? The only reason I'm allowed to say this is because half of an O2 is just an O, right? O2 is oxygen bonded to an oxygen. If I break that bond, I'm just going to be left with one oxygen all by itself, okay? If I said, if I got one-third O2, that would be wrong. I can't write that, because how do I divide two oxygens into three parts? That doesn't make sense. So you need to make sure your fraction makes sense. So this is combustion analysis. Every hydrocarbon can react with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and H2O, okay? So the combustion analysis FRQ combines molar mass with empirical formula. Okay, 
So let's say you're given that 88 grams of CO2 and 90.1 grams of H2O are produced when some hydrocarbon combusts completely. So let's say you're given that, okay? Two main types of questions you'd be asked here. A, what is the empirical formula of the hydrocarbon? Okay, so let's work with that. 88 grams of CO2. 88 grams of CO2. Again, we always want to convert to moles. Moles are the golden unit in all of chemistry. We always want to convert to moles. Okay, so how do we do that? We've got 88 grams of CO2. We multiply that by one mole over the molar mass of CO2, which would be 44. Yes. You can just look on your reference table, add the mass of carbon to the mass of two oxygens, and you get 44. So that becomes two moles CO2. Okay. We also have 90.1 grams of H2O. Now we multiply that by one mole over the molar mass of H2O, which is 18.016. And that gives us about five, about five moles H2O, okay? So if we have two moles of CO2, that also means we have two moles of carbon overall because there's one mole of carbon in one mole of CO2, so the ratio is one to one. Therefore, two moles of carbon, two moles of CO2, contains two moles of carbon, okay? Or it contains four moles of oxygen. And same here. Five moles of H2O would give us 10 moles of hydrogen, or five moles of oxygen, okay? So now we can look at the ratio between carbon and hydrogen in our products. Because like we saw up here, when we balance an equation, the amount of carbon in our products always equals the amount of carbon in our reactants. And the same goes for hydrogen. So the ratio here is about one carbon for every five hydrogens, okay? Therefore, the empirical formula for the hydrocarbon that reacted is CH5. And 5 goes as a subscript. That's the empirical formula, okay? So the general theme with uh, the combustion analysis FRQ is, okay, are you able to relate how many moles of a atom you have on this side with to how many moles of an atom you have on this side, which are the same number, and can you relate how the reactants change form, okay? How if you've got two moles of carbon on this side, how those become two moles of CO2 on this side, okay? Another common thing is they might ask you how many moles of O2 had to have reacted in this process to produce this. So let's tackle that, okay? To produce uh, two moles of carbon and ten moles of hydrogen, uh, that would mean we produce two moles of CO2 and five moles of H2O. Okay, how many moles of oxygen do we have in that? That becomes four moles of oxygen up here, 
and this becomes 5 moles of oxygen down here. Okay, so altogether, this reaction that with the quantities listed up here reacted with 9 moles of oxygen. Okay, so 9 moles of oxygen, it, asked, it usually asks you for what mass of oxygen reacted. So, simple as that, if we want mass, you know, we need something in grams. So we do our dimensional analysis, we've got 9 moles, we want something in grams, so we put the moles on the bottom and grams on top, okay? So we look at the molar mass of oxygen, and, uh, and don't make a mistake here. Oxygen, in its natural form, is two oxygen molecules bonded to each other. Therefore, the molar mass of O2 is the molar mass of oxygen plus the molar mass of oxygen. Okay, the molar mass of O2 is 32.00 because it is two oxygen atoms. Don't forget that. So that becomes 32.00 over 1. Okay, notice how this is inverted here relative to what we did over here. Because here we were going from grams to moles. Here we're going from moles to grams. And this is 9 times 32, which is uh, 188, right? No, 288. Am I tripping? No, it's 288. 288 grams. Never forget your units. They will mark the whole FRQ wrong if you forget your units. Do never forget your units. So 288 grams of oxygen reacted here. If you guys ever have any questions on stuff I'm covering here, like I have a Discord server, don't be afraid to come message me, come ask me questions. I don't charge, obviously. Khan Academy does have AP Chemistry practice problems. I'll link those down below. Um, I'm... They're not as great as the Calc BC ones, but they're still good practice. But sadly, you're not going to be able to get practice with like the FRQ problems. You'd have to come to me for those. Anyway, let's move on. Okay, so the next topic is kind of similar in that it relies very heavily on the mass molar mass unit. And that's uh, mass percent. The CED calls it mixtures and stuff like that. Okay. So, a great example of this would be they give you uh, something like CCl2F2. Uh, so, a carbon bonded to two chlorine atoms and two fluorine atoms, okay? So, it's going to tell you that find out the percent of the total mass of this compound that is carbon, okay? Find out what percent of the total mass of the compound is just carbon, okay? So what we're going to do in this case is we're going to find the molar mass of the whole species, which is the molar mass of carbon, plus the molar mass of chlorine, which is, I believe, 35.45. Let me double check that. Molar mass of chlorine, 35.45, and the molar mass of fluorine, which is 19.00, okay? Now, don't forget, these have subscripts of two, so we need to multiply all of that by two, okay? So when we calculate the whole thing, this amounts to, give me a minute, that's 120.9, okay? That's the total molar mass of this compound, okay? Now, we take the molar mass of carbon, which is 12.00, divided by the total molar mass of uh, the total compound, and that looks like it's about 10.10%, uh, 10 9 point, 10%, nine point something percent. Okay, so you'd get something around 0 0.1 or 0 0.09, 9, something like that. And you know, you multiply by your 100 to get your percent, 
and that's about 9.9% of the 9.9% of the compound's mass is carbon. Okay, the same principle applies if you were asked to find what percent of the compound's mass is chlorine. You'd find the total mass that is chlorine. So the molar mass of chlorine is 35.45, but you've got two of those in this compound, so you multiply that by two, and that would be uh, 70.9 out of the 120.9 calculator, please. You'll be given a calculator for all parts of the exam, so definitely make sure to take advantage of that. And that gives you about 0 0.586, and we multiply by 100 to get our percent, and it's about 58.6%, okay? And if you were asked to find the percent mass of fluorine as well, you know, you don't have to go through this whole process again. All percents add to 100. So we do uh, 58.6 plus 9.9, .9, and we get 68.5. Uh, 100 minus 68.5 gives us 31.5, okay? So you just, you're given two numbers, what number do I need to add to these two numbers to get to 100? That number is 31.5, okay? Save yourself the extra time when you can by just realizing that all percents add up to 100. So the percent of fluorine would be 31.5 or something around there. Again, I rounded in this case. Next topic is electron configuration. Okay, so we've all seen the Bohr model of an atom. We've seen a nucleus uh, surrounded by electron orbitals, okay? So electron configuration is basically the unit or topic that uh, studies where are the electrons and which ones are the valence electrons, which ones are the core electrons. The valence electrons are the electrons on the outermost shell, which participate in chemical reactions. The core electrons are the electrons on everything, on all the shells that are not the outermost shell. And they do not participate in chemical reactions. I've got a picture of the Aufbau chart right here, okay? So the Aufbau chart, it's a pathway that shows how electron orbitals are filled up. So this is best understood in the context of the periodic table. Hopefully it can fit both the alphabet chart and the periodic table on screen. Okay, so if we look all the way at the top left, you have hydrogen. Okay, and that's got one electron in the 1s orbital. It's the lowermost orbital. The 1s orbital can hold two electrons. So we would designate that as 1s1. The first s orbital containing one electron, the next would be helium, and its electron configuration would be 1s2. Its electrons are in the first s orbital, and that s orbital contains two electrons. The electrons in an atom are always the same number of electrons as the protons, okay? The protons are same thing as the atomic number. I think they give you the atomic number on the reference table. Yes, they do. It's the small number at the very top of the box. So carbon's atomic number would be six. That means it has six protons and six electrons. Total. Total electrons. Valence electrons are different. Okay. So if we keep going down uh, the chart, uh, we come to, what's the next one? Lithium. Lithium has its 1s orbital completely filled up, and now it starts with the 2s orbital. It puts one electron in there. The Aufbau chart is a chart with the names of all the orbitals and how each orbital is filled up. Okay, so if we go, if we jump to carbon, we see that it has 
its 1s orbital completely filled up, its 2s orbital completely filled up, and it begins filling its 2p orbital. Its 2p orbital has four electrons in it. Okay? Okay, so I forgot to mention this in the video, guys, so I'll mention it here. Uh, the s orbitals, as they fill up, can hold a maximum of two electrons. The p orbitals, as they fill up, can hold a maximum of six electrons, and then they move on to the next orbital. And the d orbitals can hold a maximum of ten electrons, and then they move on to the next orbital. And the cycle repeats for all orbitals. So, let's jump again to silicon. Silicon has its 1s2 uh, orbital completely filled up, its 2s orbital completely filled up, 2p orbital completely filled up, then jumps to its 3s orbital, 3s2. Oh no, 3p2. Oh, I made a mistake up here. It's 2p2, excuse me, for carbon. So this is what you would be expected to write out when you were asked to write out the electron configurations of an atom, okay? So this is just the basic idea of it. Luckily, uh, they made the mistake of allowing us a calculator on this exam. So if you go to your calculator, assuming you have the TI-84 plus CE, you know, the expensive thin one with the color screen, what you can do is, let me, I hope you guys can see that. If you go to apps, where's apps? What do I do with apps? There it is. If you go to apps and you scroll down to number eight, periodic, press that, press enter again, you're given the periodic table of elements on your calculator. And if you scroll down to carbon or silicon, silicon is the one we just did, you press enter, it gives you all of the information regarding silicon, including, if you scroll down, its electron configuration. So, every time you're asked what the electron configuration for an atom is, you don't need to know any of this, you just go on your calculator and use the cheat code they don't realize they gave you. Okay? Now, if you look here, this says neon 3s2, 3p2. Let me show you what that means. Okay? If we uh, write out the electron configuration for neon, the electron configuration for neon is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, okay? So, we can abbreviate an electron configuration for silicon by, since these are the exact same designations, we can just write the electron configuration for silicon is neon's electron configuration plus 3s2, 3p6, 3p2, excuse me, 3p2. We just bring those down here. All right. And if you, if you don't know what the electron configuration for neon is, guess what? Go in your calculator, press on neon, and you get the electron configuration for neon. If you do that, you'll get neon as the following electron configuration. Helium, helium, 2s2, 2p6. And if you don't know the electron configuration for helium, you can just go back and find that. Okay. That's an uh, alphabet principle with electron configuration and all of this. Now, for um, me and a lot of my friends' favorite topic, uh, Coulomb's Law. Okay. So, I'm going to show you guys an equation. This equation is never referenced on the exam. It is not needed for any part of the exam. It is pretty much non-existent on the exam. You will not be tested on this equation whatsoever. But I think it's easier to explain by visualizing the equation, okay? So, the equation is electric force is proportional to charge 1 times charge 2 over the distance between them squared. Okay? So let me break down exactly what that means. The electric force means the 
force of attraction or repulsion between two particles force between two particles is proportional to the you know, amount of charge on one particle times the amount of charge on the second particle. So as the charge on the particles increases, the forces between them also increase, divided by the distance between them squared. So as the particles become separated, as they grow further apart, the forces between them decrease exponentially. Okay. So, we cover this equation extremely in-depth in physics C, electricity, and magnetism. I hope you'll decide to stay with me for that. I think that's the next course I'm going to be doing. But for now, if you want to memorize the equation to help you visualize stuff on the AP exam, you're welcome to. You will never ever be explicitly tested on it for the AP Chem course. Anyway, if I have an electron and I have a proton, we know opposites attract. So this will be an attractive force, okay? And the attractive force between them will increase as I bring them closer together, okay? So it's like a positive feedback loop. As they get closer together, they start attracting each other more powerfully, which brings them closer together. So it's it's positive feedback loop, okay? Now, that, that attractive force very well correlates to something called ionization energy. Ionization energy is how much energy do I need to put in to remove an electron from an atom, okay? So if you take hydrogen, for example, hydrogen's got one proton and one electron, okay? This is just one positive charge, one negative charge, and so the attractive force between them is going to be really weak. So it's going to be pretty easy to steal an electron from hydrogen. So the ionization energy of hydrogen is going to be very low. Meanwhile, we compare that to fluorine, which has, uh, let me, it has seven protons, seven protons, and seven electrons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven electrons. The seven protons are a much larger charge, okay? So even though the electron, you know, a single electron, does not necessarily change in charge, the nucleus has become seven times more positively charged. And so the ionization energy for fluorine is extremely high, okay? Now let's take a look at this term, the distance, the radius. If we look at the Aufbau chart for hydrogen and for fluorine, you'll see that, uh, let me draw up the fluorine Aufbau chart, which would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. These electrons are in the second energy level. We know they're in the second energy level because the orbitals start with the 2. These electrons are in the first energy level, so they start with a 1. The first energy level is closest to the nucleus, the second energy level is further away, the third is further away than that, and the, you, you can see where I'm going with this. Okay? So, removing an electron from the first energy level of fluorine is going to be much harder than removing an electron from the second energy level of fluorine. Okay? So, the second energy level, since it's further away, Coulomb's law dictates that since the two particles are further away, they, they exhibit less of an attractive force, so it's easier to remove an electron that's further away from the nucleus when compared to an electron that's closer to the nucleus, because the closer particles, since they're closer to each other, will exhibit a stronger attractive force. This is also the basis for something called ionic radius. Okay? Ionic radius is pretty much the size of the atom, okay? Hydrogen 
is a very small atom, not because of its Coulombic forces, but because it only has one energy level, okay? If it only has one energy level, you know, it's got a really, it's only got one shell. So that's a really small size for an atom. Fluorine is also a very small atom, but it has two energy levels, okay? So the reasoning that fluorine is a very small atom is because it has a much more positively charged nucleus. And that positively charged nucleus and its uh, seven electrons exhibit much more attractive forces to one another, so they're pulled much closer to the nucleus. Now, if we exhibited, uh, if we looked at the molecule next to fluorine, which is oxygen, I believe, right? Next to, I mean to the left. If we look at the molecule the atom to the left of fluorine, that's oxygen with six protons and six electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six protons, six electrons. It still has a first energy level, still has a second energy level, but as you can see by my diagram, it's a good bit bigger than fluorine because fewer protons and fewer electrons at the same distance, same energy level, do not exhibit such a strong attractive force. So they're more widely spread out. The, pro the nucleus does not pull the electrons as close as fluorine does. So that's the principle of ionic radius. In ionic radius, the amount of energy levels you have pr plays a much bigger role. Like, even though hydrogen only has one proton and one electron, therefore it exhibits a very weak attractive force, it's still the smallest atom because it only has one energy level. Well, helium is the smallest atom. You know what? Why don't I leave that up to you? Why is helium the smallest atom? Based off of what I just told you. Why don't you try and reason that out for yourself? But, when we look at atoms that have the same amount of energy levels, the attractive force between the nucleus and the electrons becomes much more important, okay? So, the basic gist is, the amount of orbitals is the primary determining factor, but when orbitals are held constant, then we look at Coulombic forces for the determining factor of ionic radius. Okay, so another topic is electron affinity. Electron affinity is pretty much how badly does an atom want an electron, okay? Fluorine has the highest electron affinity, okay? Electron affinity is based off of two top, two characteristics, I'm going to call them. The primary determining factor for electron affinity is every atom wants an octet. What's an octet? An octet is having eight valence electrons, okay? All the noble gases, everything on the far right column of your periodic table, has an octet. That's why we call them the inert gases. Because once you have an octet, you stop reacting. Generally speaking. So, electron affinity is highest when you have seven electrons. Seven valence electrons, I should say. Electron affinity is highest when you have seven valence electrons, because you only need one more electron to get your octet. No, eight octet. I think you see where that comes from. Electron affinity is also determined by how well the nucleus can pull and attract and secure an eighth electron, okay? So, all of the halogens, the halogens are everything in the column just to the left of the inert gases. The halogens would be things like fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, etc. The halogens all have seven valence electrons, but fluorine has the highest electron affinity because, let's say we took a look at chlorine. Chlorine has its uh, 
first energy level. I should probably draw that on here to his first energy level, second energy level, and third energy level. Okay. So chlorine has many has another ring, another energy level of electrons. So when it tries to complete its valence shell, when chlorine tries to accept another electron, since that electron will come into its energy level a lot further from the nucleus, chlorine will have a much harder time securing that uh, electron, much uh, weaker attractive force with that nucleus. Then fluorine, who pulls an electron into its second energy level, which is a lot closer to the nucleus. And since the second energy level is a lot closer to the nucleus, the nucleus exhibits a much more powerful Coulombic attraction onto that electron. So it will have a stronger electron affinity. So similar to uh, ionization energy and ionic radius, it's largely dependent on two factors, okay? Electron affinity is primarily dependent on the amount of electrons in the valence shell, okay? An atom with seven electrons in the valence shell will be far more, uh, will have a far higher electron affinity than uh, an atom with six electrons in the valence shell. So that's the primary determining factor. When you're looking at two atoms that have the same amount of electrons in the valence shell, then Coulombic forces start to become your determining factor. Okay. So next topic is a pretty simple topic. It's a photoelectron spectroscopy. Photoelectron spectroscopy. Very easy topic. Okay? In photoelectron spectroscopy, uh, you're going to be given a chart. It's going to be a chart of the photoelectron spectroscopy of an atom. Okay? Chart's going to look like this, where the x axis is distance from the nucleus. distance from the nucleus, x-axis is quantity of electrons, okay? And it's going to look like this, okay? You'd have lines, okay? Where this would be one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, so distance from nucleus, quantity of electrons. Distancy from nucleus, as in orbitals, okay? So you've got two electrons here, two electrons there. This would be your 1s orbital, this would be your 2s orbital. You've got six electrons here, this would be your 2p orbital. You've got two electrons here, this would be your 3s orbital. And you've got two, three, four electrons here. This would be your 3p orbital with four electrons in it. It's an incomplete p orbital. Okay? So you need to memorize the Alkbau chart for problems like this. Okay? So you know the order of the orbitals and how they are filled up. Okay? So if we count here, we've got 2, 4, 10, 12, 16 total electrons. Okay? A photoelectron spectroscopy is uh, the is where the electrons are in a given atom. So you'd be given a graph like this, and you'd be asked, which atom is this? Okay, it's got 16 electrons, and it's got a p orbital with four electrons in it. Let me consult my periodic table. It's got 16 electrons. This is sulfur. It's that simple. If this was an FRQ, they would tell you, draw, like they would give you a graph, and they say, draw the photoelectron spectroscopy for sulfur. Okay? So you need to know what this looks like, and you need to know where all of the peaks are. So the next topic is periodic trends. Okay? So let me try and draw the periodic table. Periodic trends is basically realize the way that trends work. Okay, let me just tell you what they are and you memorize them. That's how this topic works. Okay, atomic radius 
increases as you go down this way. Okay? So blue is going to represent where atomic radius. Atomic radius is least up at neon and is most down at francium. Okay? In red, we're going to put electronegativity. Electronegativity is least down at francium and most up at fluorine. Okay, this is going to represent electronegativity. I'll explain what electronegativity is in just a moment. Electronegativity. In green, we're going to have uh, ionization energy. Ionization energy is most at the noble gases, uh, most uh, in the fluorine noble gas area, and least down at francium. And in purple, we're gonna do electron affinity. Electron affinity is, um, it follows the same path. Electron affinity is least down at francium and most up at fluorine. Now you're going to have to use a small amount of common sense with these to determine whether the noble gases are included or excluded from the trend. So atomic radius. Neon has the smallest atomic radius, so noble gases would be included in that trend. Electronegativity. Noble gases do not react. I'll explain what electronegativity is in just a moment, but just know this. Noble gases do not react. Therefore, they do not participate in, the, in electronegativity. Ionization energy. Noble gases can be ionized. They can have an ionization energy, so they would participate in that trend. Electron affinity. The noble gases have a completed octet. They don't want any more electrons, so they do not participate in the electron affinity trend. So, what is electronegativity? Electronegativity in a covalent bond the more electronegative atom pulls the bonding electrons, the electrons in the bond, closer to it, okay? So the two electrons in the covalent bond between carbon and fluorine are pulled closer to fluorine rather than residing in the center between them, okay? So what that means is because the electrons are closer to fluorine, fluorine yields a partial negative charge because it has more electrons closer to it, Carbon yields a partial positive charge because it has fewer electrons and they're farther away from it. Okay, so that creates like a dipole. We're going to get into exactly what that is in a much later unit, but just one exception I wanted to uh, show you with the electronegativity trend is carbon and hydrogen have the exact same electronegativity value. Rather, they have relatively the same electronegativity value. The difference in their electronegativity values is negligible for all questions asked on the AP Chemistry exam. For all intents and purposes on the AP Chem exam, they have the same electronegativity value. Okay, moving on to ionic compounds, okay? Ionic compounds are compounds that are formed between a halogen. If you remember what I told you a halogen was, halogens are the second column from the right right next to the noble gases, which is the rightmost column. So it's a bond between a halogen and something in the first or second column, generally speaking. Okay, something in the first column is called an alkali metal, and in the second column is called an alkaline, alkaline metal. Okay, so if you look at your uh, reference table, you see that the uh, ones in the first column are things like hydrogen, potassium, sodium, or K, N, A, if you haven't memorized your elements yet. We could take 
something in the halogen column, like a chlorine or a fluorine, and bond it to something in the first or second column, like a hydrogen or a sodium. Now, this, the things in the second column would be things like calcium. Now, because calcium is in the second column, it has two valence electrons, so it can make two ionic bonds to two chlorines, so it would be CaCl2, okay? So, with ionic compounds like these, the things that... Uh, so, the way ionic bonds form, ionic compounds form, is you have a halogen, which has one electron that it needs to make an octet, and let's continue using fluorine, for example, because that's the picture I drew up here. Fluorine steals an electron from sodium, because sodium has one valence electron, and in that process, sodium loses an electron, and because it loses an electron, it now has a complete octet, because it still has an energy level of electrons beneath that. And fluorine, since it just gained an electron, now has a complete octet, complete outermost energy level. So now both of them have their complete octets, they're both happy. But the thing about ionic compounds is they dissociate in water. Okay, now what does dissociate mean? Dissociate means they break apart into ions. What's an ion? An ion is a chemical species with a charge, and ions can only exist in water, it can only exist in solution. So when you drop NaF into water, Na becomes Na+, plus and F becomes F-. minus. Now these are two independent particles that now have their own charges, okay? When they dissociate, since fluorine stole an electron when they made a bond, fluorine gets to keep its electron, okay? So now fluorine has an extra electron, it has an extra negative charge. Sodium lost its electron in the bond. Since it loses a negative charge, it lost an electron, now it has a positive charge. And it's going to stay with that positive charge in the solution, okay? Again, ions can only exist in solution. Okay, it has a single negative charge because it was in the first column. Fluorine has a single positive charge because it was in, you know, this first column, I guess you would call it. But when you would look at CaCl2, that dissociates into Ca2+, because it was in the second column, and two Cl- minus ions, okay? So that's pretty much ionic compounds and all of unit one. Remember, if you have questions, join the Discord, ask me a question. Enjoy life.